There can be no mistakes. There can be uh, no X factor, meaning um, he can't get sick, he can't have a crash, he can't have anything that he loses a week of training. Every single day is critical. What most people don't realize is that cycling is not an individual sport. Basically, cycling is, is a marathon combined with chess, combined with NASCAR. Lance Armstrong can no more win a stage race alone than a football player can win a Super Bowl by himself. Jim Ockwitz is former director and chief of Lance's Motorola team. Each of the other riders on the team have a specific job to do, and those jobs are very clear and they don't deviate. Lance is the leader of the team. Lance is the quarterback of his team. Ulrich is the quarterback of his team. Basso is the quarterback of his team. They call the shots. Then there are people that you call lieutenants, people that can make it the furthest in the race each day. He would be the last rider to give Lance some shelter in the last mountain of the day. You would not use Lance in the race until that moment because he needs to be good in the final moment when the real race for victory happens. And then you have other people that are called domestiques. Food, water bottles, whatever Lance needs during the day, they go back to the cars, they pick up rain jackets, they bring it back through. Anybody else wanted something? I hey, didn't hear anything. Ask again. I need some water. Those are your three primary positions. And then at the end, you see Lance and the other quarterbacks come up and they start to race against each other. And that's the real drama in professional cycling when those 12 or 20 survivors are up front and, and, they're, and they're, just, they're just doing everything they can to win that race that day. At the end of a pro race, the guy who wins the sprint isn't the guy with the most speed, it's the guy who's not tired. Much like football, the main function of Lance's teammates is blocking. But instead of blocking the opposite team's defense, they're blocking the wind. This technique is called drafting. The ideal position in a group for the team leader is in the third or fourth position, where he'll only need to expend 75% of the effort of the first rider. When you consider that wind tunnel tests have shown that 80% of a rider's energy is spent cutting through the air, you can see just how crucial drafting really is. Drafting directly behind a teammate is effective if the team is riding directly into the wind. But what happens if the wind is coming from the side? In this case, they have to make an adjustment. So they ride in a wing formation called an echelon. A group of six to 10 riders could probably go over five miles farther in an hour than an individual. Each rider will rotate through for maybe two or 300 meters where you're sprinting at the front the riders behind are resting, and they'll, they'll all be sharing the work. Of utmost concern to the team is making sure their leader is rested enough to fend off an attack by a competing rider in the final stages of a race. The idea is to be with riders that you can out-sprint at the end. Or if you're a really strong rider, if you can narrow your competition down so that you don't have all the sprinters still with you. Tactically, what's happening in bike racing, it's like if one of the fastest runners that wins the Olympic gold medal in the 100 or the 200 or the 400 meter dash could follow in the footsteps of the guy in the marathon and save enough energy to come into the last 200 meters still there. And at that point, no matter how tired the sprinter is, if he still had the energy to be there, you can imagine what he would do to the marathon runner in the final 100 or 200 meters. He would basically beat him by 50 meters. The thing I've always enjoyed the most about cycling is that the strongest rider doesn't always win. It's generally the smartest rider. This battle of the team leaders is where the rubber meets the road. It's where the medal of a cyclist is tested and true champions emerge. Eddie Merckx, Bernard Hinault, Miguel Indurain, and now, of course, Lance Armstrong. These are the heroes of the great sport of cycling. Lance may be the discovery team leader, but this man is the discovery team mastermind. Johan Brunil is probably one of the smartest guys, the cleverest tacticians that ever rode the tour. Johan Brunil 
director sportif of the Discovery Channel Pro Cycling Team, boasts an impressive riding record. A career high point was setting a record for the fastest stage in tour history, 30 miles per hour. In his job as director, he dictates tactics and strategy to the team via radio. Lance Armstrong, having seen these conditions go from absolutely miserable to abysmal, some of the worst of the year so far, and so much rain has fallen, it's making the communication very tough between the team directors and the riders. Well, he's giving him a new earpiece there, Bob, but how on earth do you put it on it in conditions like this? I, to put it on it. I know, I know, I know. What do I look like, Houdini or something? <laughs> In fact, Lance and Johan even raced against each other in 1995. It's these former competitors that have become not only friends, but accomplices. There's absolutely no doubt in my mind that if Johan hadn't been Lance's director, he wouldn't have won his first tour. There are probably several of his tours he wouldn't have won. Very good, Lance, very good. Come on, come on, come on. Very good, looking good. With riders from 15 countries on the Discovery Squad, the fact that Johan speaks six languages fluently proves an invaluable communication aid. There's a lot of information coming into the car, which tells us who's ahead, how many seconds the breakaway has. Okay, so uh, five riders left in the front now, five riders left in the front with Chechu. I have to make sure that they know the course, uh, tell them what's coming up front. A lot of water flooded. The road is flooded, like three to four kilometers ahead of you. In the big races, we have also TV in the, in the car, so that's another, another device where we get a lot of information on. I, I just try to put myself up there and, and, and think how I would do it, to be as economic as possible and just save everything for the final. I think he's the best in the business. We were linked up you know, six, six years ago for, for absolutely no reason. It's just one of those times in history when somebody comes along in your life and, and makes a huge difference. Motivator and mastermind, Johan Brunil is without a doubt one of the all-time great directors in the sport of cycling. But long before Johan, Lance had another director sportif that was a little closer to home. When he was 10 years old, he was running in 10Ks. And not only just showing up for the race on Saturdays, but during the week, he was running and training. I would map out a 6.2 mile course for him and he would train during the week on that course. He started doing triathlons and was competing when he was 14 years old in triathlons. I got a call in 1985 from Lance's mother saying her son's a triathlete and she was looking for sponsorship. And I was just trying to be polite. I was thinking, oh, give me a break, lady. And I asked, well, what kind of results has he had? And she, she told me what his results were. And I realized that he was better on the bike. He was ahead of all the gods of triathlon, all the best guys. And he was 14. And I wanted him riding our parts. The first time I ever talked to Lance on the phone after I talked to his mom, and his 14-year-old triathlete, was probably the most arrogant, obnoxious 14-year-old I ever talked to in my life. And I thought, well, he's really talented. Uh, I think we'll sponsor him anyway and just take a chance. I would say confident, and people, other people would call it cocky. Um, but I say that's what gives him the confidence to win. He wound up being the youngest world champion on the road ever at the age of 21. <laughs> 